Hey everybody, it's Adam again, and here's our next lecture in EpiBio. Today we're going to talk about common research designs used in epidemiology. Here are our objectives. So we know that research is essentially that, that process where we're trying to answer some sort of question, um, and we're trying to answer that with our you know, data that's which has hopefully been uh, you know, collected appropriately. You know, some examples would be, you know, what is or, or was the frequency of a disease, say, in a certain uh, geographic location at a particular time. Um, and what you're going to find is the answer to this is generally descriptive, um, but it does not mean uh, that just because it's descriptive research that it's going to be a simple task. You know, you're just kind of describing here's how often people got the flu at this particular time of year and you know, things like that. Um, we're going to find that whether it's quantitative or qualitative research, uh, that it is tending to be descriptive. You're just describing the information that you're pulling um, from the data. Uh, and so you'll find that the research only improves if the quality of the data uh, is improving as well. And similarly, the, the, kind of the pitfalls for a lot of research out there is that they have really kind of poor data uh, that they're working with. And so the way that we're going to collect this data and how we arrange it and analyze it is going to be called our research design. So uh, another question could come up and is, you know, what causes disease? If you're looking for an answer like this, you're going to be generally looking for hypothesis uh, generation, right? You're going to be developing a hypothesis that is, um, you know, listing out your possible candidates for a cause of disease uh, and obtaining some of that initial evidence that would support, say, one or more of these candidates. You know, obviously, if you're looking between two different groups, um, you would say, hey, you know, there the, are null hypotheses. They, the reason why they both develop these, these disease is the same reason. Reason versus that there's something else that is, is going on, you know, a particular cause for these particular people getting a disease. And so we have to test that, right? Um, and so making predictions from these hypotheses and kind of examining new data helps us to determine if those predictions are going to be correct, right? So um, if a hypothesis is not supported by the data that we're pulling, uh, should it be discarded? You can start all over again, um, modified to maybe uh, with you know new evidence that's come to light, maybe modify it to uh, kind of better fit the data, or uh, and ultimately you should be testing it again. You know, trying it out, make sure that it is uh, sound. So as we look at these different um, research designs, you're going to realize that some of these are appropriate for generating kind of new hypotheses, and then you're going to find that some are appropriate for actually testing a hypothesis you've already designed. Um, you're going to find that some you know, designs are going to be good for either, you know, depending on the circumstances and kind of what you're looking at. Um, but the basic function we're going to see of most of the epidemiologic search uh, research is done out there is they're either going to try to describe uh, the pattern of health problems accurately, right? So when do people come down with this disease? You know, when, what type of risk factors do these people have? And then the other feature would be um, trying to enable kind of a fair, unbiased comparison to be made between a group or possibly multiple groups, um, either without a risk factor, a disease, uh, preventative or therapeutic intervention. So this is going to be kind of more, um, what you'll see is that you, you typically find that the um, ones where you're making comparisons are going to be typically more about uh, testing a hypothesis versus just describing a problem, right? When you'd see um, a kind of more descriptive sort of uh, study being done. So we're going to go into detail on the different types and we'll get a little bit clearer idea of um, what each of the study designs are good for. And then when we have our um, in-class journal clubs, we'll, we'll look at some different um, study designs and see how they're appropriate or possibly inappropriate for um, the problem they're, they're aimed at. So some of the things that you'll find, you know, a good research design for an epidemiologic study should perform uh, can include one or many of the, the following. So for one, they can enable a comparison of a variable, um, things like disease frequency or presence of risk factors between, say, two or more groups at one point in time. So they can see, you know, what those differences are and if those differences are due to chance or not. Um, they can look in some cases between one group, say before and after an intervention, so kind of a pre-post sort of thing. We obviously know that already that there's different um, sort of statistical tests you're going to do based on that, um, you know, between um, using paired versus unpaired sort of uh, tests as we've seen previously. They can also allow the comparison to be uh, quantified in absolute terms. So we can look at things like risk differences or a rate difference, right? We're subtracting one group from another, essentially, to look at the absolute difference. Or we can look at relative terms as well. So again, you're dividing one um, rate or risk by another. So we can get things like relative risk or odds ratios. And we'll talk about when those would be appropriate for which uh, research designs.
It may also be able to permit investigators to try to determine, say, when a risk factor in the disease occurred. Um, so they can try to determine sort of a temporal sequence uh, there. And again, that helps to establish more of a causal kind of relationship as we've seen previously. And then also we would like to minimize biases, like to uh, minimize confounding and kind of other problems that may complicate the interpretation of data or may, to, you know, may give us results that are not um, really true based on what the, the data we've collected is. So depending on the design that we've chosen, um, they help with developing these hypotheses or they can help with testing. In some cases, maybe both. Um, one of the first things we'll look at are going to be cross-sectional surveys uh, and also ecological studies. They're going to be really good for developing hypotheses. They're typically going to be more on the descriptive side of things, kind of describing what uh, the scope of a problem is or describing just what's going on in a particular area. And then we're going to see cohort studies and case control studies, and we've already talked about a few of these before in the biostat section. They can be used to either develop hypotheses or they can actually test them. Notice that you don't want to develop hypothesis and test it within the same study, that you can't really do double duty in those cases. You need to really, if you're going to test a hypothesis, you have to go into the study already having one available, right? And then um, obviously we have randomized controlled trials or field trials, and these are going to be best uh, for testing a, a hypothesis, um, which can include things like new treatments to see how effective they are or preventative measures. Typically what you're going to see is that the strength of evidence or a causal relationship is going to be best with these randomized controlled trials or these field trials. It's going to be less strong with a cohort study or case control study and then it really can't really, uh, all you can really see with the cross-sectional or these ecological studies are really going to be kind of associations. So you can find an association with a cross-sectional study to help you develop a hypothesis for say like a causal relationship and then you can possibly do you know a retrospective sort of study that helps to kind of strengthen that association right it gives you a little bit more of a clue about the causal relationship and then a randomized clinical trial again these are most often going to be the most difficult and most costly to perform they're going to give you the, the strongest strength of evidence to say yes this causes this or this prevents this or whatever it happens to be so you can kind of keep those things in mind when we're looking at the strength of evidence that we're getting from these different study designs so this table is going to be good for reference. You can kind of go back and look at the different study types and see what their both their advantages are going to be and what their disadvantages are going to be, right? Um, so we'll talk about each of these in more uh, detail as we move forward. So first off, we're going to look at observational uh, designs for generating hypotheses. So the first type of uh, study we'll talk about today is going to be a cross-sectional survey. And basically this is uh, generally going to be pretty descriptive, pretty observational in nature. Um, this is going to be uh, simply a survey of a population at a single point in time, right? So again, you're not looking for new incidents of disease or things like that. You're typically looking for prevalence of things. And so uh, some example of this could be like an interview survey or some sort of mass screening program. Um, typically this could be done by say like a telephone survey. Uh, it could be mailed or emailed out, you know, questionnaires like that. Um, you've probably turned down a few of those in your days that they probably sound like telemarketers in, in a lot of cases. But um, again, you're going to find that there is some issues with this, right? So uh, typically you're only going to have a particular type of person really kind of responding to these sorts of surveys. You know, like a lot of people just throw them out. Um, you know, a lot of people put them in their spam folder and their emails and all the things like that. Um, so there's a lot of non-responders, a lot of refusals. And so the people you do get back typically tend to be more motivated to do those sort of things in the first place. So again, you can already start to see some uh, selection bias there from a, uh, from a participant standpoint. But and relatively speaking, they're pretty inexpensive uh, to perform, pretty easy from a, a standpoint. Um, but again, uh, you, you'll find some that are going to be much more uh, labor intensive or much more um, uh, kind of extensive. And that, a good example of that would be the U.S. Census. So this is actually required by law to have a response to this, and, and they follow up with all non-responders. Uh, being, you know, it's, it's a pretty standard kind of feature of that. And again, that happens every every ten years. So we're actually due for one uh, in the next upcoming couple of years. Now, as I mentioned, they're fairly quick, easy to perform, and they can be useful for just trying to look for prevalence of risk factors or maybe frequency of prevalent cases of a disease for a design, uh, you know, defined population. And then you can measure things like current health status or if you're trying to plan for like health services or things like that, this can be very useful for that. Again, it's quick, pretty easy. You know you're going to get a lot, a lot of non-responders, um, but you can at least look for like trends over time, especially if you kind of get kind of consistent response rates and things like that. So um, again, you can't really pull a lot of good causal relationships from this, but you can start to look for some associations. So some other disadvantages you'll find with the cross-sectional surveys is that you can't really establish any kind of good temporal relationships or any kind of presumed cause and effect because you're collecting information at the same time. So either the presence of a risk factor or in the presence of disease, um, you can't 
typically get a good idea of like, you know, kind of which came first, um, what's kind of the time relationship here. So that's another thing that kind of is another ding against it. Um, another disadvantage is that uh, the survey kind of selects out um, for longer lasting or more indolent cases of diseases where uh, people are living with it for a longer period of time versus, you know, if you were to say have the flu, get over it pretty quick versus if I have diabetes, that could be a lifelong thing for, for a lot of patients. So um, the diseases you're more likely to be found by survey are going to be with these people who are living longer with them. Um, and so this, you know, obviously is enabling uh, affected individuals to be interviewed with kind of very severe diseases or things that tend to be rapidly fatal or they um, people overcome them very quickly um, may not be found by these surveys. Right. And they call this the, the Neiman or the late look bias. Right. Um, and the other thing is, you know, called uh, length bias in some of these screening programs is where you tend to find, or at least are selecting for less aggressive cases because they end up to live for longer and are more likely to be available um, to be found at, at the screening time, right? So very severe, very uh, quickly fatal cases, you're not going to find those super well. So you can do repeated cross-sectional surveys and they can kind of help to determine those changes in risk factors or say disease frequency in populations over time. Keep in mind, um, you don't get a good idea for that nature of the association. You can't really look for absolute numbers because again, you're gonna have a lot of non-responders, um, but you can at least look for those trends over time. And so we can start to look for associations, we can start to generate hypotheses, but we cannot really test the effectiveness of things like interventions or to look to see for any actual um, true differences, statistical differences between groups, right? Um, and in these surveys, uh, investigators uh, may find that subjects who indicate they've had, you know, been immunized against the disease had fewer cases of the disease, right? So you're looking at that and you can you know, start to make some associations, but you know, is the finding due to the fact that people who sought immunization were more concerned about their health? Maybe they would have been less likely to expose themselves to the disease in the first place. You know, we call this a healthy participant bias. Um, so again, there's lots of different types of biases that can be introduced here. And it's important that both the researchers kind of, uh, you know, elucidate on these uh, in, their, in their studies and their, in their articles, and that you're also gonna be kind of key for looking for those sort of things. So if the authors don't mention something you find to be a pretty glaring defect, or something that's missing, um, you can kind of take that in your total interpretation of a study. So we find that cross-sectional surveys tend to be of particular value in infectious disease epidemiology. Uh, we can look for things like prevalence of antibodies against infectious agents, uh, and then when you're analyzing by age or other variables, it may help us to determine evidence about, say, when or in whom infection has occurred. So obviously, if you've had antibodies, chances are you've either been immunized or you've had the disease at some point. So that can kind of give you an idea of, you know, what kind of age populations are you more likely to have uh, developed these in, right? Um, if you have proof of a recent uh, acute infection, they can be obtained by two serum surveys that can be separated by a short interval. Uh, in these cases, you can have the first serum samples called an acute sera. They can be collected soon after symptoms of, say, like an infectious disease uh, appear, you know, and then you can do second uh, serum samples that can be called the convalescent sera, and those are usually going to be collected, say, 10 to 28 days later. Um, so again, you can start to look for the proof of acute infection by looking at these different um, uh, these different samples here. And what they find is that a significant increase in that serum titer uh, of antibody to a particular infectious disease would be proof of uh, recent infection. Um, even if you didn't have uh, two serum samples that were taken, you can also get some pretty important information from uh, some of these blood draws based on titers of IgG and IgM uh, just in a single serum sample. So what you guys have probably learned about in, in micro and different things like that, high IgG titer without an IgM uh, uh, to a particular infectious agent would suggest um, that the infection occurred kind of in the distant past versus if you had a high IgM with low IgG, that would suggest kind of current or very recent infection. And an elevated IgM in the presence of high IgG would suggest that the infection occurred in the fairly recent past, right? So by looking at those sort of things, um, you can start to get some ideas about when the disease may have occurred. We can also have what we call ecological studies, which is a type of cross-sectional study where they're looking at um, relating the frequency uh, of disease along with some characteristics. So if we're looking at smoking uh, and an outcome of lung cancer, and we're looking at a specific geographic area, so you know, certain cities, counties, states, whatever it happens to be, and that can be, again, useful for suggesting hypotheses, but you can't really draw a true cause and effect relationship between the two, right? Um, you don't have any information about whether people who smoked are the same people who developed lung cancer. Maybe unknown whether an exposure um, or the beginning of lung cancer came first, right? You can't get that temporal relationship. Um, there could be other explanations for the observed association, right? So maybe if you did the survey in an area where there's lots of coal mines, perhaps that could have been a cause for lung cancer rather than just smoking by itself. Um, 
Now you may have you know, some concerned citizens, uh, they may be unaware of some of these weaknesses. Uh, it's called an ecologic fallacy, and they'll use findings in some of these surveys to make statements such as, you know, there's high levels of toxic pollution and cancer in northern New Jersey, so the toxins are causing the cancer. Again, we may, that may or may not be true, hard to say, but we cannot true, uh, draw a true cause and effect relationship from this sort of study. There can be some cases where an important hypothesis initially is suggested by a cross-sectional ecologic study and then can later either be proved correct uh, or incorrect by other types of studies. Um, so for instance, if you're looking at rate of dental caries in kids who are found to be much higher in areas with low levels of natural uh, fluoridation in the water than in areas with high levels, right? Um, that is a good hypothesis that is generated from a sort of uh, cross-sectional ecological study. And then went ahead and did subsequent research and they found that an association was causal. And again, they used a different type of study design. And that's when they started to introduce uh, water fluoridation and fluoride treatment of teeth. And then uh, seen with some pretty striking reductions in the rate of those dental caries. You may also find what we call longitudinal ecological studies. Um, and so, you know, long right there in the name, these are going to be things that are kind of ongoing studies uh, of surveillance and are going to be measuring trends and disease rates over you know, many years in a defined population. So by looking at trends of disease rates with other changes in society, if there's a war or there's immigration or some sort of you know, introduction of a new, say, um, infectious disease or vaccine, anything like that, they can try to determine the impact of those changes on disease rates. Good examples of that would include like when the um, inactivated in the oral polio virus, I'm sorry, uh, polio vaccine resulted in a pretty precipitous decrease in the rate of paralytic poliomyelitis in the US. Uh, because of the large number of people that were involved in that program and the relatively slow rate of change of other factors, uh, we were able to try to determine the impact of the actual public health intervention. You know, there's no other major causes that were causing these, these shifts that they could figure out. So it was deemed you know, that they say, well, these changes must be due to this new vaccine and it seems to be pretty, pretty effective. So confounding uh, along with other factors can distort conclusions drawn from a lot of these ecologic studies. So, you know, if the time is available, the investigators really should be performing what we call field studies uh, before trying to pursue a new large scale public health intervention, right? So this is why we should do, you know, these kind of cross-sectional or ecologic studies kind of um, initially to generate a hypothesis and then you do a field trial to actually test out the hypothesis. And we'll talk about field studies a little bit later on. But for instance, you know, if you were uh, have an example of a longitudinal study uh, looking at the rates of malaria in the U.S. population in the 1930s, um, they found that it peaks uh, in malaria rates. It can be readily related back to social events. So a lot of that comes back to wars uh, and immigration, right? So it's not something uh, you may necessarily be able to do a whole lot of like, public health interventions about necessarily. But looking at these longitudinal studies, you can see here, um, let's see, uh, time being on the x-axis here, and then that reported cases per 100,000 of the population, um, you can see uh, where kind of rates will kind of um, peak and, and uh, have their peaks and troughs at based on different things. So for instance, um, relapses from veter uh, Korean War veterans, um, return of Vietnam War veterans, you know, foreign immigration, um, all these different things can have an effect. And looking at longitudinal um, ecologic studies can be very useful to kind of look at this, um, these kind of trends. So, um, Next up, we're going to look at observational designs for generating or testing hypotheses. So as I mentioned with these, um, these ecological studies, you can have a causal association being suggested, but you can't really necessarily have the actual cause and effect relationship being um, proved by one of these studies. But for instance, some things that have been suggested, you know, say 20 years after there was an increase in the smoking rates in men, lung cancer rate in the male population began to increase pretty rapidly. 20 years after women began smoking in large numbers, lung cancer rates also started to peak. So you can start to see, you know, the writing is on the wall in a lot of these cases, but you can't really go back and say, absolutely smoking caused this increase in lung cancer, right? Um, and the studies in these cases were longitudinal ecologic studies in the sense that they're only really using national data on smoking and lung cancer rates. Um, they did not relate things like individual cases of lung cancer back to individual smokers. Because you're kind of looking at two different features here, you can't necessarily link lung cancer to the individual smoker. Uh, again, that was difficult to draw that cause and effect relationship. But in order to establish a stronger causal relationship, we can do this with both cohort and case control studies.
So a cohort study. A cohort is basically a clearly identified group of people that we want to study. And basically what we're going to do is that investigators will start out by uh, assembling basically one or more, co one or more cohorts. Uh, by choosing people specifically because they were maybe uh, exposed to one or more risk factors. You know, maybe you have one group of people who are smokers, one group of people who are not smokers, uh, again, that being the risk factor. Um, or you could just do it by taking a random sample of the population. After you have the cohort of study subjects, uh, they are going to be followed over time to determine whether or not they develop the disease of interest, or in this case, the risk factors uh, that were measured at the beginning of the study predict uh, whether or not the disease actually occurs, right? Um, basically, what you see is that this is going to be more of a prospective sort of study. Again, this is going to be more difficult to do as far from a logistical standpoint than like a retrospective uh, case control study, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, but again, you're taking people, uh, putting them in the cohorts based on their presence or absence of certain risk factors, and then you follow them forward to look out for disease. And again, that's important to keep clear because this will be in contrast to our case control studies in just a little bit that we'll talk about. So again, the defining characteristic of the cohort study is the groups that are defined on the basis of exposure and then are followed for outcomes, right? So you're starting with the exposure or the risk factor and then followed up for outcomes. Um, as I mentioned, we'll see with case control studies, you're going to be doing this based on the outcome. So whether or not they had disease and then you look backwards to see if they had an exposure. Okay. So again, there are going to be um, two different types of cohort studies. Um, I mentioned the prospective one already, but there also could be a retrospective type as well. So these tables here are nice because they kind of give you a good um, idea of how these different studies look based on when they're being performed, right? Whether or not they're retrospective or prospective. Uh, essentially here on the x-axis, we have time, we have past time, we have present time, and then the future. Uh, and then looking at the prospective cohort study, a retrospective cohort study, and then the case control study. So with the prospective cohort study, I'm starting out with a cohort of people based on their presence or absence of risk factors I'll collect today. So for instance, I could, um, for instance, grab uh, out of the student uh, group, you know, the 64 of you uh, uh, taking the class. Um, I could pull out the people who have, say, exposure to uh, asbestos, right? Um, then I would follow that the cohort, the, both those who were exposed and unexposed, and say for 10 years, 15 years, and see who developed lung cancer, right? Um, so that would be a prospective sort of study. Again, I have to follow that cohort for a period of time and then determine if they develop these outcomes. For a retrospective cohort study, you're doing the same thing, but you're taking this historical data, again, assembling your cohort based on that, and then you're looking towards the present time to see which of those people develop the outcome they're interested in. And as you might imagine, retrospective studies are going to be a lot easier to do. They typically are cheaper because you're just doing data collection. You're also going to find, though, this can be more difficult to draw those kind of nice cause and effect relationships because the data is missing. People are, um, you know, there's there's uh, biases there. The data just doesn't really uh, of a sufficient quality. You may not be able to really draw those same conclusions as you would as if I was doing a, a prospective study where I'm doing all the data collection in active time. Right. Um, on the other hand, we'll have our case control studies. These are going to be assembling groups based on whether or not they have the outcome of interest, so whether or not they develop lung cancer or not. And then I look backwards to see who had exposure to uh, asbestos or whatever the exposures I'm looking for. Right. And then we can make inferences about this. We can look at these associations and try to start to develop a, uh, a possible cause and effect relationship here. So the prospective cohort study, as I mentioned, we're going to see that the investigator is going to assemble the groups uh, in present time, and they'll collect that kind of baseline data on them, including, you know, obviously how they get into the cohorts is based on the risk factors. And then I will collect that data for a period uh, that can last, you know, many years in a lot of cases. And the, the advantages of doing this, as I've mentioned, is that they are able to control and standardize the data collection as the study progresses, and they can check on the outcome of events as they occur, uh, ensuring that they can actually correctly classify all of that. So because the researcher is knowing that they're doing it themselves, they have a pretty good confidence in the, the quality of the data they're getting. From that, you can get estimates of risk um, that can be obtained from a prospective cohort study that are true or absolute risk for the group studied. Um, and you're going to find that many different disease outcomes can be studied in these cases, right? Because you're, again, assembling them based on their risk factors or exposures, and then you're kind of looking forward. So you can look at all kinds of different disease states um, to see what develops in these different uh, cohorts. Now, cohort studies will have some disadvantages. Um, only the risk factors that are defined or measured at the beginning of the study can be used. You can't kind of, you know, five years down the road, add in another risk factor because, um, again, that will kind of distort your cohorts, right? 
Typically, prospective studies have a lot higher costs associated with them, a lot bigger time costs as well. And then the other problem you run into is loss of study subjects to follow up. You know, if you did a retrospective study, you have all the data available to you right then. Um, but here you'll have people that will be lost to follow up because they either lose interest in the study or uh, whatever happens. And then you have to wait a long time to get the results. One of the classic cohort studies we have is the Framingham Arch study, we've kind of mentioned previously, um, which had, uh, began back in 1950 and continues on even today. Um, and I'll show you in the next table, basically an eight-year risk of heart disease that gets calculated from the Framingham study equations. So they look at several different things. Um, basically, this is one of the tables they've developed where they have a risk that a 45-year-old man will have cardiovascular disease within eight years. They'll look at things like um, if they're a smoker, glucose intolerance, all these different things. Um, and they'll find, uh, based on the, the cohorts that they were placed in initially, followed up for that disease, they can look at several different risk factors um, that they kind of set out from the beginning. You know, they were kind of measuring people's blood pressure. They were measuring people's uh, glucose. And they were, you know, putting them into different cohorts and then following them forward for many, many years to, to determine how likely they were to develop, you know, cardiovascular disease. So um, some of the time and cost limitations for the prospective study can be mitigated if you do it as a retrospective study. So as I mentioned in that approach, investigator will basically go back in time. They'll basically define their risk group or you know, people who are exposed. And a good example is people exposed to the uh, Hiroshima atomic bomb blast in 1945. And they would follow those group members up to the present to see what kind of outcomes had occurred, whether it be cancer or death or whatever it happens to be. And so the advantages here is that it's going to be a lot easier to um, you know, uh, do this from a cost standpoint. It's very quick to do because again, you're only just collecting historical data and then looking up to the present time. Um, and the other thing is you can also uh, be able to look at these kind of absolute risk, right? So we'll see that with the uh, case control studies, we're gonna be looking more odds ratios and things like that. But here we can still get absolute risk, which is uh, useful. And this is going to lack the ability to really monitor and control the data collection process. So this is one of the major disadvantages is that you really have no control at this point, uh, mainly because of the fact that, um, you know, whatever data is there is there. And that's kind of it for the most part. Um, so, for instance, when I did my coral snake research uh, project for fellowship, um, you could classify as a retrospective cohort study. Um, one of the things we were looking at is whether or not people got treated with immediate coral snake antivenom versus those that in uh, waiting. And we were looking for outcomes. So essentially, I was looking back towards, like, I think 1998 was the, the time period where we started looking at the data. And then we were able to follow that up to um, basically, you know, 2015, essentially, look at all these coral snake bites. And people got, got stratified based on this uh, risk factor, right? This whether they got immediate antivenom or they didn't. And then look to see what kind of outcomes, you know, things like intubations and uh, anaphylaxis and all kinds of different things um, that we were able to look for. Um, again, it was very easy to do from a uh, cost standpoint and from a time standpoint. Obviously, you saw to go through all the data, but you can find major inconsistencies in how good the charts are. Um, some people classify different uh, outcomes and differently. And so this is one of the issues you run into with these retrospective cohort studies. Thus, the cause and effect relationships you find with the prospective study tend to be a lot stronger, those relationships, um, because you know the data collection is done uh, pretty consistently versus a retrospective sort of study. So a good example of this would be a retrospective cohort study done back in the 60s. They were trying to look at uh, the effect of prenatal x-ray exposure. Basically what they were seeing is that in the past, radiographs were used to measure the size of the pelvic outlet of pregnant women. Um, exposing their fetuses to x-rays in utero, which nowadays we think is a general uh, no-no. Uh, but in this case, they, they may not have known what the, the risks were at that time. But basically, they went ahead and identified one group of subjects who had been exposed in utero and then another group who had not. And they, you know, again, this is a retrospective data they were looking forward to the present time. And they determined how many subjects from each group had gotten cancer during childhood or early adulthood, right, up until the time they actually performed the study. And what they found was that the individuals who had been exposed to this x-rays in utero had a 40% increase in the risk of childhood cancers. They ended up developing a risk ratio of 1.4, essentially, um, after they had kind of uh, accounted for other factors and other confounders. They controlled for those things and then found that, yes, they did have an uh, increased risk ratio of, uh, you know, uh, 1.4 times the risk of developing these childhood cancers than people who were not exposed to, to x-rays in utero. So in contrast to the cohort studies, we have our case control studies. And this is where the investigator uh, is basically going to be selecting a case group and a control group on the basis of the outcome. So did they have lung cancer? Did they develop... Um, you know, uh, sepsis or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Uh, they may say, hey, this group has the uh, the disease in question, this group does not, right? And then we're gonna compare 
these groups by looking retrospectively and looking at their different uh, risk factors and different things that they were exposed to to try to determine um, if there's any differences there. Because you're looking at the risk of having uh, the risk factor in the two groups, right? So you can say, okay, all these different people have lung cancer. Let's look backwards to see which proportion of them were, were smokers, right? And so you're kind of looking at these risk factors to see which ones tend to be more associated with um, either lung cancer or, or not developing lung cancer. And so looking at the actual risk of the outcome can't be determined from a case control study because we don't really know what the underlying population is, right? Um, with a cohort study, like we set what the population is, we set the in in that situation. Um, but with a uh, case control study, you don't know what the total number of people you'd be dealing with the denominator. So instead, what we can do is use uh, an odds ratio. We can look at the relative risk of the outcome. Um, are we going to get an estimate of the relative risk of the outcome by using an odds ratio? Um, so again, what are the odds of someone having this risk factor if they had cancer versus if they had no cancer? What are the odds of them having this risk factor? So you'll see that the cases and the controls are going to be assembled, and, and usually they're either probing medical records or interviewing the patients or their relatives regarding past exposure to the risk factors. Um, now you're going to find that time relationships in a case control study are going to be pretty similar to those in a cross-sectional study. The investigator is kind of learning everything simultaneously about current disease state and then any risk factors that may have existed in the past. So it's very difficult to determine which one came first, right? How long before the outcome did the risk factor start, you know? So there's a lot of kind of caveats with this uh, where it is uh, difficult to establish these kind of uh, these relationships here. And a case control study differs from that cross-sectional study in the fact that the sample for the case control is going to be chosen specifically from groups with and without the disease of interest. Um, so you're kind of assembling um, the groups differently than you would see in a cross-sectional study. Cross-sectional is just looking at everyone um, you know, within a population at a given time versus me actually uh, assembling the groups based on whether or not they had the outcome in question. Now, all the people with the disease of interest in a geographic area and time period can be selected as cases, and this may help to reduce some of the bias you would see in case selection, right? So instead of looking at a very small subset, you're kind of looking at a whole uh, geographic area or something like that in order to help make sure you're kind of being more inclusive and try to reduce some of that bias. So case control studies are especially useful when a study has to be done pretty quickly and inexpensively or, and this is another important feature, when the disease being studied is pretty rare. So if it has like a, a prevalence less than 1%. So imagine if you're doing a cohort study and you're looking at, say, exposure to, um, say, french fries causing a particular outcome that is super, super rare. You could you know, have uh, maybe 100 people who are exposed to, say, the french fries versus people who weren't. Follow them for 10 years, and if the, the, the outcome is exceedingly rare, you may not find anyone that develops it. On the other hand, with a case control study, you're starting out, you already know who has had the outcome, the disease you're interested in. You can look backward to see what the risk factors were. You can look back to see if they were had french fries or not. Um, so again, in that cohort study, you mentioned, you know, uh, huge number of study subjects need to be included here just to find those rare cases. And this is the benefit. Uh, only one outcome you're going to be considering, uh, but many risk factors can be considered when you kind of look backwards at these case control studies. So also, uh, case control studies are very good for generating hypotheses concerning the causes of a disease, and they can use that and follow it up and, and do some testing. So there are certain disadvantages to using a case control study. So for instance, uh, if you're trying to determine the risk factors um, for you know, patients based on interviews and, and um, things like, um, you know, things you're trying to recall, if they forget things, they forget details, and that's called recall bias, right? So that would be um, people who you would count as not having a risk factor and they truly did. And so the other thing is not easy to know what is the correct control group for these cases. You know, you wanna make sure that the cases uh, the control people you're setting up are going to be very similar to the cases. You want to have, uh, for every case, you're going to have, you know, several controls who are similar in uh, age, sex, and, and oftentimes race. You want to control for as many, many things as possible, uh, so that way when you look backwards, the, the patients are very similar, and you can look for those risk factors that are different, uh, and so you can have a stronger, you can make a stronger causal association there. And so, um, for instance, if the controls were taken from the same hospital and were examined for a disease, uh, say pulmonary disease, uh, they probably had a similar workup, right? They probably all had chest x-rays and spirometry done. Um, so that way that uh, asymptomatic cases of the disease would be less likely to be missed and they could be classified as controls, right? Because otherwise, if they had the disease and get classified as a control, that's going to skew your data as well. Another example of trying to find good controls for your cases would, uh, you know, especially if you're looking for birth defects, you may choose um, infants as a control who were born right next, uh, same time period as the the infant, uh, the, you know, the case in question um, at the same hospital, 
same sex and race and mom had a similar age and from the same town. This way you can kind of control for several things like season, location, all these things, right? They don't want to make the cases and controls as similar as possible with really just that uh, presence of disease or not really being the big difference between them. And then when you look backwards, you can see if which risk factors are truly going to be um, causing uh, the, this effect here we're seeing. Um, it can be very difficult to select a good control group um, with no bias. Uh, obviously, you can't eliminate all bias. So in some cases, you may find two or more control groups get assembled, um, one of which kind of by the means we've already talked about, and then the other one would be from the general population. Kind of see what differences you, you might find there. Um, the other thing you might do is overmatch, um, in which cases if you make the patients too similar to one another, um, you may actually be trying to match for one of those things where um, the actual causal uh, or risk factor um, is kind of missed. So for instance, if you're looking at some of these early studies of lung cancer, um, if cases of controls have been matched based on their smoking status, uh, that would have been found as, um, you know, it would not have been found as a potentially causal factor, right? So you don't want to control for that because that could be one of the things that's causing the effect we're seeing. One example of a case control study uh, was trying to clarify the etiology of this 1989 epidemic of eosinophilia myalgia syndrome, uh, and they were seeing that it was associated with an over-the-counter dietary supplement of this L-tryptophan. And so what they did, they had two case control studies uh, that were done to test the hypothesis that the source was these supplements from this uh, Showa Dinka manufacturer and trying to determine the odds because again, you're using these case control studies, odds ratios are gonna be used here, um, that the source of the pills made a difference, right? So pills from maybe one uh, plant versus another was making the difference here. Now, if the source made no difference, then the odds of developing this eosinophilia myalgia syndrome would be the same regardless, right? Um, or their odds of having um, you know, pills from uh, different locations really would be the same, be one essentially, right? Um, when they compared one group who used pills from the that show a Dinka company versus use of pills from all other manufacturers, they found an odds ratio of 57.5. I don't have the, the uh, confidence interval here, but I can probably be rest assured that um, the odds are 57 and a half times higher that people who developed this eosinophilia myalgia syndrome were, uh, got pills from this, this particular company. So it seemed pretty, pretty damning evidence there. Um, now, when another group undertook a similar case control study, they found an odds ratio of 19.3, just showing that this is why it's important to have repeat studies to make sure they're showing similar results, right? Um, in both cases, the odds ratio uh, for the association um, was pretty strongly elevated, and so because of that, you can say that, well, it's very unlikely to be due to chance alone that we're finding these results, and um, you have a better idea of this kind of cause and effect sort of relationship. You can also have what we call a nested case control study. So it's a relatively new type of design for clinical research that will basically consist of a cohort study um, with a nested case control study. So you kind of start with a cohort study and then you have this, it's what we call it nested. It's kind of like a, uh, one of those Russian nesting dolls. Um, basically a cohort of patients is identified and the baseline characteristics are gonna be obtained by interview, physical examination, all that kind of pertinent uh, information. And then they get followed for their outcome, just like a normal um, uh, cohort study would be done. Now, patients who develop the condition of interest then become cases in a case control study, and patients who do not develop the condition become eligible for the control group of a study, right? Um, next off, the cases in the representative or the matched sample of controls are then studied, and the data from the two groups get compared, kind of using these analytic methods that are appropriate for a case control study, right? So we're kind of doing both uh, in which we're kind of doing a prospective sort of uh, cohort study, and then we end up doing kind of a retrospective sort of um, uh, case control study um, and trying to see you know how the, this information links up. So uh, just a good example of this would be a nested design that was used in a study to evaluate the question about meningitis. You know, was there an association between the prior use of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and the frequency of non-bacterial meningitis? So what they did was the patients for the nested case control study were taken from a large prospective cohort study of patients admitted to the ED for suspected meningitis, right? So again, usually you're using, uh, for these nested case control studies, you're using a small subset out of a larger study that was performed. Um, so anyway, so they use patients from the cohort, they designed this nested case control study. Basically what they did were that cases were consisting of patients uh, in whom non-bacterial meningitis was diagnosed, and then they had controls consisting of sample patients in whom meningitis was not diagnosed, right? So those are controls they can control based on, you know, age, uh, gender, all these different things to try to eliminate some of those confounders because they're in really interested in that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory use. And so um, using patients 
on whom you already had the data available made the study pretty simple and, and less costly, right? So again, uh, one of those things where you may see follow-up studies being done for very large cohort studies or randomized controlled trials. Um, that way they can start to you know, either develop new hypotheses or try to do um, uh, some hypothesis testing. Now up next, we're gonna look at experimental designs for testing hypotheses. And so there's two types of randomized controlled trials we have. We have uh, randomized controlled clinical trials and then field trials. Um, both designs are gonna be pretty similar have the same kind of steps uh, and will have very similar advantages and disadvantages. Major difference between the two are that uh, clinical trials are usually used to test like a therapeutic intervention in ill people, or people who have the disease. Field trials are usually done to try to test preventative interventions as well as uh, in, in well people in the community or people without disease already. So essentially what we're gonna do uh, with these studies is we're going to start up by recruiting study participants Notice these are all gonna be prospective in nature. We're gonna randomize people to uh, one of two groups, or it could be more than one, uh, it could be more than two groups in these cases, but in this case we'll have two. They will have, uh, basically you measure everything in baseline, and then you're gonna have the experimental intervention, which could be uh, like a new, um, you know, campaign about you know fighting obesity, or it could be a new drug, or whatever it happens to be. You measure the outcomes. So at the same time, you're going to have your placebo group or your non-experimental intervention, and then you're going to end up having your outcomes as well. And by comparing these two, you can see whether or not the experimental intervention had any effect, right? So again, um, looking at things like independent and dependent variables, we're going to be seeing that the the independent variable thing that we're setting is going to be whether or not the uh, people got the intervention or not, and then the uh, dependent variables will be these things we're measuring as the outcomes. So in a randomized controlled clinical trial, oftentimes referred just to a randomized controlled trial, an RCT, um, they are gonna be enrolled in the study and then randomly assigned to one of the following groups, right? It's either intervention or the control group. Okay. They were getting placebo or some sort of other uh, method of treatment, usually like the gold standard of treatment. Um, a lot of times you have to consider what the ethical implications of the control group are going to be. So, for instance, if you're looking at uh, risk of for cardiovascular death um, and with a new antihypertensive treatment, um, the intervention group can maybe get the new drug, but the control group is not really ethical to not treat hypertension in, in people, right? Because we know that hypertension leads to cardiovascular complications. You can't really do that. So you may do like a gold standard sort of thing like um, we're going to give these people an ACE inhibitor versus is uh, people in the intervention group are going to get this new class of drug, whatever it happens to be. Now, randomized controlled trials are going to be considered the gold standard uh, for kind of studying interventions because they really help to minimize bias, really helps to limit, um, helps us to strengthen those cause and effect relationships. Um, and it's impossible to completely eliminate bias. And we'll see that they pose some challenges and, and ethical dilemmas, but they are going to be our gold standard for establishing the highest level of evidence that we have um, to show cause and effect, to show that yes, this drug caused this effect. Yes, this health prevention technique was, uh, was effective. These are going to be the gold standard. They're also going to be the most labor intensive and costly, but again, um, you gotta, um, you put in the time and effort uh, and money in a lot of cases in order to get this kind of good evidence. So with randomized controlled trials, you may hear single blind, double blind studies. And so this is a very, very important aspect of a randomized controlled trial. Um, basically, if you were to have a single blind study, this would be where the patient is not aware of whether or not they're actually getting experimental intervention or non-experimental treatment. Um, for instance, uh, if they're getting experimental drug versus placebo. Um, if you ever hear of a double blind study, this is gonna be where both the observers who collect data are also prevented from knowing which treatment the patient is getting, right? So a patient doesn't know what they're getting, the observers don't know what they're getting. Um, a really good example of this would be with the um, some of the studies we've done at, at Nemours, um, where the only people who know in the hospital whether a patient is getting drug or not is actually the pharmacist. And that's important because we will set up the drug, um, we will get it uh, ready to administer, and then the people who are doing the measurements and assessments of the patient, even the doctors, they have no idea whether the patient's getting drug or not. And this helps to make sure they have completely objective measurements and assessments of these patients. Um, because again, as a pharmacist, we weren't doing any any assessment of the patient, um, so we were okay to know that sort of thing. Uh, and it's kind of funny because the nurses would always come by and they'd be like, "Oh, I think this person's getting drug, and I think this person's getting placebo," but they really had no way of knowing. And and the reason why we do this is because this helps equalize that placebo effect, right? We know placebo effect is, is a very powerful thing. You know, um, the the mind can cause the body to do all sorts of things, and so by making sure the patient doesn't know what they're getting, we try to minimize that placebo effect. Um, 
And so this can take uh, its uh, uh, form in many different ways. For instance, you know, for say a drug trial, um, you know, if the drug comes in a blue capsule, you have to make sure that the um, the placebo comes in a blue capsule as well. They have to look identical. They have to weigh the same. They they do lots of different things to make sure that the patient and observers cannot tell what the patient's getting. Um, you know, another good example I mentioned with that, uh, the Nemours study, there's one uh, for kids with spinal muscular atrophy or SMA, and it was actually a drug we had to use um, intrathecally, right? So we had to perform an L lumbar puncture in order to give the uh, the drug. And so it was one of those cases where in order to make sure the patients knew that they didn't know if they were getting placebo or not, we actually had to give dummy lumbar punctures to the uh, some of these children. You know, some people may have some qualms with that, and certainly I was kind of like, well, that seems kind of messed up to have to give an unnecessary lumbar puncture. But... It's one of those things that you do to make sure that you can minimize those sorts of uh, biases and, and the sorts of placebo effect that can happen there by saying like, well, I know this patient's getting drugs, so they must be doing better, and their their assessments may reflect that. Right? It's kind of a measurement sort of bias. Um, the next slide we're going to show here is actually a study from um, the physician health study we mentioned before, just to show you the difference between the two. So this is a pretty common kind of uh, thing you may see with some uh, research uh, projects that are being done, where basically a patient would end up getting this kind of blister pack of, of pills and, and capsules, and they would have no idea um, what they actually contain, whether it's placebo or they actually had drug or not. Um, and so the patient uh, who's getting drug or the getting experimental intervention, this would look the same as the people who are getting placebo, essentially. Um, there's usually like a number that would be associated with this that the whoever is uh, the one handing out the drug or the one dispensing it, they would be able to know. And it's really important we do kind of meticulous um, record keeping for this sort of thing. So that way we know whether the patient's got drug or not. And so uh, one other thing to mention that blinding is super, super important that we maintain that. And actually there is um, a lot of um, uh, a protocol that goes into that and whether if you, you know, break blinding on a study and if a patient found out what they were getting or not, there's actually huge ramifications, especially if a drug manufacturer is you know, funding a trial. Um, they may come in and may actually stop the trial completely from your site, you know, depending on how bad the, the breach is. Uh, so again, it can be pretty serious. Um, and, and this is one of the things we do because again, it's so important to eliminate that um, that placebo effect. Now, it's usually impossible or unethical to have patients participate in a blinding um, uh, study involving like, surgical intervention just because that would require a whole you know, sham operation. Uh, I mentioned that lumbar puncture example a few minutes ago, and that was you know, considered by our institutional review board to be uh, ethical, right? It was okay, you know, the risk versus the benefits weighed or weighed such that it was okay to do this sort of study. So it just it's done on a case by case basis, and it depends on the disease you're looking at, it depends on uh, so many different factors to decide whether that's an okay study to do. But um, oftentimes, if it's non-surgical, uh, investigators can develop some sort of effective placebo. And so um, you will find as well that it's unethical to do an intervention if it's strongly really to be believed to be the best available, whether or not it's really been established scientifically. So for instance, there's never been a randomized controlled trial to compare prenatal care versus no prenatal care um, in, in, you know, infant outcomes. Like that would be kind of silly because even though there's no study to say, yes, prenatal care works, um, it's pretty much common sense that, you know, someone who's being evaluated at least somewhat regularly by their physician, uh, it's going to be a good thing, right? Um, so again, you'll never see a study because it would be considered to be unethical to not provide care to uh, a patient. So um, in RCTs, uh, bias is possible through several things. We try to minimize this as best we can. So for instance, we do um, randomization to get patients. Uh, that way we're not trying to uh, allocate them um, in certain groups to cause bias. We're trying to do a prospective design. So we're kind of looking forward in time and we do the double blinding. Now, in, if you're comparing two groups, um, there may be different rates at which patients drop out of the study or if they become lost to follow up. You know, so that, that is important to consider as well as look at their uh, fallout rates. Um, you know, therapy changes and dropouts are going to be special problems here. Right. And so especially if it's involving severe diseases, uh, advanced cancers, things like that. Um, and you have to be able to account for that in the, in the study, in the article when they, they publish that. And so, you know, patients, if they receive a new treatment and they fail to respond, um, you know, either they or their physicians may decide to try a different treatment in which they have to be allowed to. So people are always allowed to pull out of a study. It's always on a voluntary basis. They have to voluntarily agree to join a study and they can pull out anytime they want without any negative repercussions, right? Um, again, this is all uh, to try to make sure everything is as ethical as possible. Um, also, you know, if the patient's starting a new study and they you know, decide that the, you know, the side effects of a new treatment are so unpleasant, um, you know, even though it's effective, they may drop out as well, right? Um, so, for instance, you know, for testing an antihypertensive, but it causes a lot of erectile dysfunction, um, a lot of patients are just going to drop out. They're like, I'd rather have high blood pressure. I'd rather try something else that doesn't cause uh, this erectile dysfunction.
So one of the other big things we have to contend with, um, especially with reviewing literature out there in the world, is uh, this concept of publication bias. And this is basically a type of selection bias where we're only going to see um, studies that people publish, essentially. And so this includes things that people want to make public or things that the journals um, want to publish. <clears throat> That's what you find that pharmaceutical companies or investigators may not wish to publish the results of negative trials, meaning they don't find uh, you know results that favor the intervention they were being uh, that they were testing. And this is important because you know you need to see the negative trials to be able to take it into context with the positive ones. And if you only see positive trials, then you kind of lead you to think um, possibly some erroneous uh, conclusions. And so again, a lot of people don't like to do follow-up studies as well. A lot of people like to just um, you know do a study, show uh, you know an association once, and then they don't do any kind of follow-up um, you know uh, studies that duplicate those findings. And that can be very important as well. You want to make sure that results you see aren't just a one-off sort of uh, thing. So in an attempt to reduce this publication bias, uh, a group of editors created a policy that their journals would basically consider publication only if the results of RCTs have been registered with a clinical trial registry before the onset of patient enrollment. And so this requirement kind of forced all trials to be registered before they began. Um, and that way uh, they had to have this registration done if they were wanting to be published in any of these kind of major medical journals. And so, um, you know, you can go to things like clinicaltrials.gov and see trials that are actively going on. Um, they have an idea of kind of what's out there. And that way, you know, if studies weren't published, they could go back and find, okay, what happened to that study? You know, what, what was um, the results of that? So on the other side, we have randomized control field trials, and these are very similar, except here we're typically trying to look at an intervention as a preventative measure rather than therapeutic. So, um, you know, appropriate subjects will still get randomly allocated to different groups, but one will receive the preventative measure and the other will receive placebo or, or some other, you know, kind of gold standard sort of uh, treatment or uh, prevention uh, method. And so then these people will be followed over time to determine the rate of disease in, in each group, essentially. So again, very similar to randomized controlled trials. This is just dealing with that preventative measure. So some examples include things like vaccines to prevent uh, polio, uh, administration of, say, like a six-month course of isoniazid to people with um, who have a positive conversion on their uh, tuberculin uh, skin test. Uh, you know, to try to prevent reactivation of dormant infections, and then um, you know, aspirin to reduce cardiovascular disease. Now, one disadvantage is that these results can take a long time to uh, obtain, you know, unless the effect of the treatment or the preventative measure occurs pretty quickly. Um, but again, you know, to think about things like aspirin being used to prevent cardiovascular disease, like, well, it could take a long time to really kind of discover that based on the kind of patients you're looking at, right? Um, the younger the patient population is, perhaps the longer it's going to take to manifest something like cardiovascular disease. Another thing I've uh, mentioned before is this idea of external validity or the ability to generalize the findings to other groups of people. As I mentioned, um, you know, if you only look at, say, middle-aged white men for a trial, that can't really be generalized over to, say, uh, adolescent female uh, Asian uh, population. And so it's important to look at the generalizability of a study and, and take that into context when you're interpreting it. And if you can apply that study back to your patient, if it makes you know, reasonable sense or not. So the next thing we'll look at are uh, called data summary, cost effectiveness analysis, and post-approval surveillance. Now these are kind of formal epidemiologic research design, but they're important techniques uh, that we're going to use uh, anyway to try to examine um, you know, various things going on uh, and using data collection in, in clinical research. And so um, we'll have things like you know, meta-analyses that can be used to summarize information from many single studies on one topic. I've mentioned that before, but again, being able to pull in all the studies talking about, say, um, aspirin for the prevention of cardiovascular disease, um, you can start to make that information more generalizable because you're including more patients. You're getting a, a, a wider and more diverse set of uh, you know, uh, population that you're looking at. Um, decision analysis and cost effectiveness uh, are able to utilize uh, summarized data and how they can inform things like clinical or policy decisions. Uh, insurances do this all the time. You find a lot of studies out of places like Kaiser Permanente um, where they are using uh, information about either um, preventative medicine or uh, therapeutic uh, applications of uh, things to try to figure out what's the best, most cost-effective way to take care of patients because you know it's obviously in the insurance company's best interest to um, provide care as cheaply as possible. And so we'll talk about all three of these techniques a little bit later on in more detail. Um, so you know, just uh, hopefully you're on the edge of your seat waiting for that one. <laughs>
Um, so one thing to note here uh, regarding data summary is we'll see, um, you'll, you'll see this a lot in guidelines and, and meta-analyses and things like that, but there's a uh, basically a, a hierarchy that was developed by this uh, U.S. Community Services Task Force um, that tries to determine um, the quality of data in a study, kind of the internal validity of it. Um, and, and I'll show you this on the next slide, kind of how these can be broken up, but basically they kind of give you the strength of evidence of an article or a piece of, of literature to see how, um, how much you can kind of take away from it. how good is the study as far as the the research design and, and the validity of it so you can see here it kind of goes from rank uh, one uh, down to several categories of rank two down to three and so you can see here that it's important to understand when you're looking at things like um, meta analyses and, and guidelines that you make sure that you're trying to pull from as much kind of high quality uh, evidence as possible. And you notice here, you know, at least one properly randomized controlled trial. Like randomized controlled trials are going to have the, str uh, the strongest um, or the highest strength of, of quality data um, seen with it, right? So you can get the best idea about cause and effect relationships, um, much more so than you'll find with other um, other types of studies, right? So this is again, one properly randomized controlled trial. Um, down in these kind of category two, you're gonna see more things like, okay, well maybe it's a cohort or a case control study. Maybe this is something like a case series and things like that. And then finally at the very bottom, this is where you're gonna have things like just individual case reports or opinions from respected authorities in a given field, things like that. So again, obviously you wanna have lots of high quality uh, data, you know, it's kind of uh, it's quality rating one, um, but you may find that for things that we just don't have good data on or things we don't have a lot of good studies due to ethical considerations Considerations, things like that, you may be relying much more on this kind of category two and three sort of data. So you know, another thing we can do as far as post-approval surveillance goes is that obviously the, the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA, um, they uh, approve drugs for use in the general population based on relatively limited study sizes and study durations. You know, we don't test drugs for, you know, 30 years to see how patients do with them because again, that's the, the patent's only 20 years as we know. And so what we typically do are longer term post-marketing surveillance. And again, we call that phase four trials as, as you guys know, um, that we can monitor for people for a long period of time. As I mentioned, anyone who's taken a drug, you're a part of a phase four trial. And again, um, this can lead to things like taking a drug off the market if they realize their safety concerns with it. Um, and so that cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor, like uh, rofecoxib or Vioxx is one uh, really big uh, high profile example of that, where lots and lots of people are taking the drug, but it had to be removed from the market due to this increase in cardiovascular events. So anyway, that concludes this section here. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to write. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next time and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks so much. Bye.